Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Joy Eklov from Canada on behalf of the World Forum for Ethics and Business and the World Forum for Arts and Culture. I welcome you to this panel. The pandemic has changed our lives in many ways, but one that is likely to stay for the long run is the increasing dependence on the internet to stay connected. While online platforms have created a profitable avenue for virtual offices, schools, and meetings, it also required a paradigm shift in how we consume art and how art can reach us. To the millennials, this shift may have been inevitable, if not preferable, but there exists a league of established artists who have thrived through real world performances, enchanting live audiences with their art. But with strict restrictions and sanitary regulations, such spaces of common sharing have been forced to shut down. This has, however, not stopped our panel today in sharing their performances. They have adapted, adopted, and assumed the internet. In these difficult times, these glimpses of their blissful heart have managed to uplift many lost souls. Some have even been able to widen their audiences through the global reach of the internet. Let us understand today how they have managed to complete this transition, what have been challenges, and what they believe lies in the future of performing arts. It's my pleasure to first introduce Lenka Lichtenberg. Lenka is a Czech-Canadian musician, composer, and producer who aspires to build bridges among cultures in a passionate and awfully deeply, deeply spiritual celebration of her roots. She has released seven albums and won the Canadian Folk Music and International Independent Music Award. Lenka's latest project is The Thieves of Dreams, based on poems she recently unearthed that were written by her grandmother in the Theresienstadt concentration camp during World War II. How, Lenka, has the pandemic changed the experience of sharing your art? Well, thank you for your introduction and thank you for inviting me to be part of this forum. It's uh, very special and it's, uh, it's a great honor for me to participate. Uh, I will first say that uh, it's not been easy. I, I don't know any artists, especially not in my particular age group and category where you could say that this was easy. It still is a struggle, in fact. And uh, I am now at a point where I feel like I am not back to normal, but definitely getting better at managing the new paradigm and the new normal, what we have in our world. But the uh, first few months, maybe I would say even a better part of the year, uh, 2020, have been very, very difficult uh, with uh, uh, lots of wonderful things that I had lined up, uh, premiering new, uh, new works and so on, tour, festivals, all that scrapped. And it was a first year in my life where I actually have never, where I haven't performed to live for live uh, audience. So that was very, very difficult. And I didn't know how to come to terms with it. And uh, I have been luckily invited to participate in various concert series and so on. And that uh, showed me the way that, uh, uh, yes, you can still connect with people, even though it is so very, very different. Uh, in my particular case, I am a, a composer, but also a performer who uh, very much um, thrives in sort of like a two-way street with the audience where uh, you feed off the energy that comes at you from people reacting. And if it's nothing, uh, just the energy coming back at you uh, makes me happy and uh, energized to do what I do. And when you're singing in a vacuum, like to, in a studio or to just your walls, it's a very much a one-way street. And so for me, the challenge was how to come up with the right motivation, the right energy to uh, still feel I am actually doing um, justice to, to my art when I'm singing to a screen. And uh, that 
has gotten better, but it's I haven't quite overcome that issue, I have to say. So I'm very curious to to hear what other people have to say about that. <laughs> it still feels um, like this uh, one way, uh, one way street. But regardless, uh, inspired by many others who have been perhaps more successful overcoming this, I have uh, restarted projects that I dropped last year. And uh, another reason is purpose. For me, uh, it's uh, the energy is one challenge to overcome, but the other one probably that helps with that is to find purpose. And that was another thing that I felt I kind of lost. Why create anything if, if I can't really impart it to people the way that I would like to, that I find useful and could uplift them because you, you have no idea if maybe there is a global audience, maybe there's somebody in Australia that will listen to what I just did, but I will never know. And, and so it's just like, uh, uh, it feels like uh, very limited. So, so that was another challenge for me to get past that in my head and in my emotions and just to say, okay, even if I don't know if anybody ever listens to this, if anybody ever will, uh, there is a reason for this and there uh, is a purpose for my art. And so that has kind of propelled me. So uh, my, my, my suggestion to others would be to to uh, to look more uh, to more look uh, inside and uh, find that right energy and to find that right purpose for what you're doing. Thank you, Lenka. Purpose is obviously crucial, and I understand what you mean about the energy. To be in touch with that. Thank you. Our next guest is Didi Nini Thoak. Didik Ninik Thoak is a renowned Indonesian cross-gender dancer and choreographer from Central Java. He is of mixed blood, Indonesians Chinese and Javanese. He has learned many other classical dance forms, such as Indian, Japanese, Chinese opera, Balinese, and several others, and has collaborated with international artists and performed internationally. May I ask you, do you feel there has been a shift in your audiences? Are you able to connect to a wider geographic of audiences across age groups and geographies? Thank you for inviting me in this uh, panel. I would like to share my experience during uh, this pandemic. Actually, in the beginning, it's very hard. And then I stuck everything, all of my, my stuff, already sent home, and then I have to work alone. But uh, as an artist, we cannot stop to be creative. Then uh, according to the audience, some of the audience, of course, they are so disappointed because usually they can watch my performance live on stage. But now they just watch uh, through uh, via internet, just with a small screen, then no, I can say no interact between the artists and the audience because in the performance, we need the energy, just like circle energy from the audience and the artists and also from artists to the audience, this is the problem. Since Indonesia is very, very big country with many islands, 18,000 islands, then some of the audience still, they are happy because now they can watch my performance through YouTube or Instagram or through, through many, many social media. That's one some of the uh, good response. But still uh, difficult for me because uh, we need sometimes, we miss the audience. We miss the applause from the audience. The problem is, for example, I have to perform comedy because my performance frame with the comedy. If I have to, to, to joke in the front of camera and then nobody laugh and then I feel very strained in the beginning. Very difficult because usually if we perform comedy, then uh, the people laugh. This is make more energy to the artist. And this is, I cannot feel this for a while. But I still do do something. That that's why I work a lot in YouTube with many drama or 
with many uh, dance lesson through YouTube and also online performance. But the problem is in Indonesia, uh, the live performance, uh, I mean, through social media is, we can say, unusual. I mean, uh, the people are not familiar with this kind of system. That means we have to teach the people to more understand how it looks like the performance through social media, through the internet, through the YouTube and so on. I think uh, this one. From, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. The feedback and relationship with the audience, so crucial to our arts. Thank you. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Yuriko Lochon. Yuriko is a practicing artist who studied art at a well-known art institute in Kyoto in Japan. Marriage is the reason for leaving her environment and throwing herself into a situation where she is inventing herself as a person and an artist who sees things from a just and fair point of view. Yuriko, the pandemic, the pandemic has isolated human, human beings around the world. All types of art forms have helped bring solace to people. Being an established artist, have you managed to own the online space to teach your art to people around the world? Yeah, thank you very much for you know, inviting me to have a chance to share my ideas and experience the pandemic time. Frankly speaking, I still could not kind of you know, adjust to the situation and uh, it's still a kind of a process of you know, finding myself while I'm, you know, in uh, such kind of a situation. And, uh, you know, for, for me, uh, so to say that uh, the experience which you can, you know, get through the uh, internet, as far as the, you know, art objects or, you know, painting or, you know, such kind of things are concerned, it is, you know, as uh, you know, Lenka also told, and uh, it's uh, like performance, uh, performing art. It's absolutely a different thing. It's going to be a you know different experience, I think, and uh, it cannot be replaced. You know, two things are absolutely different uh, thing. It seems, and uh, you know, it can be you know grow in the uh, different way and it cannot be treated as the same. That is, you know, kind of a overall ideas, which I have, you know, uh, to ask the question which Deborah had. And uh, like, uh, as soon as, you know, they have, uh, you know, they means the ch uh, children of this generation who was born, who's been, you know, who was born in uh, su such kind of, you know, media which is available in front of them as soon as they graduate from their you know physical experience which is you know uh, the touch of uh, their mother they uh, you know got into such smartphone video has they have, you know become first their visual experience and uh, you know i think it's which is kind of virtual and it's uh, actually passive not kind of an act active mode of uh, experience and um, you know yet the physical experience you know involves active participation by eye hands ears and uh, you know dealing with material and the, you know movements by sound are very important and uh, you know while realizing their inborn creativity so, you know, because this physical experience is the only experience, I think, which is directly related to our five senses. That's what I feel. And, you know, virtual experience is somewhat being kind of programmed by somebody. The, you know, color which you can see on the, you know, uh, panel um, means the uh, what's computer, you know, surface or tablet surfaces are all being programmed. It's not the color which, which you know, we, which you kind of, you know, try to get or create it, uh, you know, going towards that. 
kind of a thing, which, which is, you know, managing the one which has been kind of provided kind of a reading. It's a kind of different experience which you do, you know, actually while you are painting. Virtual experience has a certain refinement, but uh, it is, which is not through your creativity based on uh, your original feelings or experiences. And in this virtual world, certain refinement has been already been programmed, which I have told you. So this is kind of an idea which, you know, through your you know, question, Debra, uh, I have kind of, you know, got, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, Yuriko. You're included so much there that needs to be talked about, especially the senses and how that translates to technology. Thank you. Our next guest and speaker is David Ladov. Professor Ladov has composed many works, mostly for voice, solo instruments, and chamber ensembles. David is also an influential scholar of general and musical semiotics, including computer-based research on music and expressive gesture. Throughout his career, he taught in Mexico, Brazil, and Germany, and was a member of faculty at York University in Toronto, Canada. David, do you think this move towards online platforms will be beneficial in the long run for traditional art forms? I'm not sure. When you say traditional art forms, uh, I, I, you, you used those words for me before. I wasn't quite sure what you meant, but I see this wonderful panel and all the different traditions that people here represent. I think uh, we can see that the answer has to be mixed. It has to, it's different for different arts and it's different for different traditions. I think a positive thing that's coming with our investment in the internet is that for some very limited practices, like for example, European string quartets, it's sort of good for the diaspora that we can be more in touch as a group. And one of the, um, I think one of the profound powers of music, perhaps the only one really is that it, um, it, pulls people to, it, it pulls people into a group. You know, we lose our skin when we're involved with music and it's as if we share a body in some ways. And I don't, and I think having the internet as part of the mix, I think that's an enrichment, but I have to say, that's certainly not one that depended on the pandemic. Music has always been very responsive to new technologies, I think. Uh, and I think you could take that all the way back to inventing new ways to make a pod rattle. Right through history, if there's a new technology, music is quick to take advantage of it. That meant iron and steel in the 19th century when it meant the, the piano became a loud instrument because the the strings could be held on an iron frame or steel frame. Uh, and uh, Wagner could invent his new tuba and so on. So there's always been this effect of, I think probably of all the arts of humanizing technology. That being said, the three speakers who preceded me, I would say they're spot on. We've lost one thing we've lost and not figured out how to compensate for is the loss of frameworks. I was watching a wonderful concert on the internet yesterday, the Array Music um, here in Toronto, Joseph Petrick, who's a master of the button accordion, played a series of pieces, but they were terrific. And there was also some mixing visuals that corresponded to layers of electronic and live sound. But um, little things get emphasized that we weren't ready to go that fast. For example, there's no introductions, there's no program notes, there's no noise from, there's no noise from people folding their programs. Those, you know, good, but it's, it's a very different sensual experience as Eureka was pointing out. And um, so there's, there's a lot of little stuff that we can improve on, but I think compared to the, the big technical changes in music, this is a minor, a minor matter. You know, the real big things 
in, in European music in the 1200s, writing became important. Being able to note things, notate things, put them on paper, completely changed the way musicians think. And then printing expanded that very much. So in, I think in a long-term perspective, the pandemic will not stand out as more than giving us a little push to go faster in things that were happening anyway. Broadcasting and recording, huge changes for music, huge changes for style of life, because you can't have a lot of people earning their living as performers mm -hmm. once you start having the primary um, distribution of music is electronic, it turns people's lives upside down on that level. It also turns the quality of sound upside down. Those are real big changes. The pandemic is relatively, for music, is relatively a minor event that we make personal. It's not for individuals, it's not minor. There are a lot of individuals who are severely displaced, but for music as an art, I think it will be uh, a qualifying thing when we look back at this age, uh, not me personally, but people looking back from a hundred years forward, uh, climate change is gonna look like a much bigger issue than the pandemic. We've I had pandemics it. before. You know. Wow, I really appreciate your perspective of putting it in perspective, that change has been normal all along. Thank you. Our last speaker on this panel is Ayu Lakshmi. Ayu was born in Singaraja North Valley. She's a singer, as well as a gifted songwriter, dancer, actress in film and theater performer. Her music project titled Suara Semesta employs many musical idioms from across Indonesian culture and features undeniably religious and spiritual undertones. Lakshmi has been participating actively on numerous stages of festivals, both locally in Bali and internationally. How have you been to practice and promote your art online? And how have you been able to manage with the fast pace of interactions on social media platforms? Thank you, Debra. First of all, I would like to say thanks for all of the parties who organize uh, this panel. And I'm so grateful to be a part in this discussion. It's really interesting. And I'm going to uh, continue uh, the answer of the, your question, Debra. Uh, I practice uh, every day, everywhere in my daily life, commu communicating to a family at home or among my friends and to people I met, could be anywhere. Uh, it's not especially intended, but most of the time I present myself in an artistic way. Even though the things that we discuss or we deal with just an ordinary things. So if I can say I celebrate every single day with a theatrical presentation, whether it's through music, dance, uh, poetry, and acting or theater as well. So, uh, as we all know that I'm living in Bali and in Bali it's, we have so many celebrations, we have so many ceremonies and most of the Balinese like, uh, you know, uh, having uh, their daily life is uh, it's in the theatrical presentation. So um, the place, the time, the people I met and also the situation, I think they are actually the truly guru, the truly teacher. Uh, and, and as well, the space that I can practice, that I can learn something new, that I can inspire by situation, by people that I met. And that's also how I celebrate uh, the skill and talents which has been given by them. And for the next question, how uh, 
um, promoting the art online. Well, of course, at the at the beginning, it's quite difficult because you know, I, most of the time I work alone. Mostly, I create like uh, short videos, content. Mostly, I create by myself, starting from creating a storyboard and film shooting uh, from by the uh, modest, a simple camera from my cell phone and uh, create some music, uh, back sound, and as well, final editing. And, but, you know, from the small concept, sometimes growing become a bigger concept and you know, uh, I share to, to whenever I got a basic concept and getting bigger concept and I share to my team, then we continue to create a kind of uh, live streaming or a live tapping. Then of course that involving many parties and many artists as well. And then uh, we create more professional that sometimes we send a proposal to government and we need a support because it's quite difficult to, to sell a ticket by online or virtual show. At the moment in Indonesia, it's, it's quite difficult, but we try to like, you know, uh, day by day convince the audience that this is the fact that we have to deal with in the pandemic situation. And after... Uh, uh, for this kind of program, like, you know, like uh, for live streaming, then involving many artists, uh, I, I create like a package uh, art performance. So involving many artists as well. Then after that, it's uploaded in the social media. So during the normal, uh, the new normal, uh, actually, I do virtual show, it's quite often. <laughs> Sometimes without any planning, how you call impromptu. And I'm also very often invited by many other artists uh, from Indonesia as well abroad. And most of them that uh, I met, whether accidentally or not, uh, they have a uh, same energy, same frequency and same interest. So no wonder that sudden collaboration is quite uh, often happen. So in this kind of situation, we can like, you know, uh, promoting one each other because I'm in for in their project or the other way around. So whenever they have a project, so I'm the one who promote them. And last answer is how I manage the interaction on social media. Well, I love sharing with others. For sure, the things that I share, the things that I know, at least the things that I got directly related to but mostly about art for sure, but could be something else, something about like your food, fashion, or, or craft gardening, or could just, you know, some stupid, stupid thing, some entertaining action or many others. And as we know, the people we create on social media, uh, they have a different backgrounds, and different and interests. However, I promote all of my activities mostly in artistic presentation. I think that's all I can share to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ayu. There is so much, and I appreciate your mentioning of collaboration and how that yes. also changes online so much. Well, I know everybody has been able to share. We've found some things that are similar in the viewpoints and in the different arts that are represented here now. And what I'd like to ask actually is another question. 
do you feel that learning an art form online, as many of the next generations are doing, diminishes the depth and seriousness of the form or impacts it in different ways? I don't know if I can answer the question, but I can tell a little story. I had a Zoom meeting with a um, teacher about my age, younger than me, but not much. And um, she was in the, it was a small group of us and she had been displaced from her teaching, which is not art teaching, it was sociology or something. I don't remember exactly the field. And she said, for me, teaching is a contact sport. I want to be able to smell my students. And uh, I think the, the problem that you're raising is connected to that because of this business that we are, we're sensualists, you know, we all depend on sensations in the arts. And, and um, I don't know that the, that the issue about that teaching is, is really an issue about the arts or it's an issue about teaching in general. So, you know, that's two ways of looking at it. I think that a lot of good teaching though must be happening now with the internet. Thank you. Yes, I think that's a very uh, um, uh, relevant perspective. Thank you, David. Yes, Didik? Yes. In my experience during pandemic, if I did uh, the technique of traditional dance, actually, if, I if we learn only the technique is easy through internet, but to teach how to, I mean, to teach uh, how to give so in the movement is not easy because this is process. And then teacher in the traditional way how to teach in Indonesia, teacher should touch the body of the student. Then they know very well the technique, how far, for example, the position of or mudra should be like this, should be like this. If we watch on internet, we, we just imitate. But we cannot feel the feeling or the soul of the movement we cannot teach from them. Uh, but I have experience to teach a stage makeup. <clears throat> I think stage makeup is more easier because uh, the stage makeup we uh, like drawing and then for example I have to teach the character of monkey then I have to teach step by step for the base and then how to draw the eyes and so on and so on. This is more easy when I teach makeup, only for dancing, no. But there is uh, something good also. If we have recording in YouTube about how to teach dance, actually this is kind of a preservation technique. Then our technique or our uh, dance style, still we can see on YouTube. This is something something good also, because I think the documentation is uh, not easy because uh, of the technology now is uh, everything digital. Sometimes I have a very huge documentation in my office about many different performance and many uh, different uh, activity I did. Sometimes because of human error, then I lost. For example, I already lost one terabyte hard disk a lot of documentation is very hard. But when I put uh, documentation in YouTube, at least uh, they're still somewhere else. And then we still keep that kind, kind of the, another technique of preservation, I think. This is my idea. Thank you. Yes, very interesting, the, the combination. It's a technology and it really is what we do with it. Very interesting, thank you. Want to comment, Lenka? Yes, please. I wanted to share my experience uh, leading a choir, which I suppose uh, would qualify as a teaching traditional type of music. Um, as an ensemble. It's something I started like right, uh, right when the pandemic started last March and we've had sessions with the choir uh, every week since. Uh, so that has been really a spectacular experience in many ways where of course music is particularly bad for Zoom uh, of course because of the delay. And um, uh, so I 
cannot hear my choir members. It's nine wonderful ladies, um, but they hear me. And I think somehow the experience of sharing the music together and we talk in between each song and uh, we, I have suggestions and so on and so forth, but, but I can never hear the choir uh, as a whole. So it doesn't seem to take anything away from the pleasure that we get uh, of being a choir. And uh, in order to overcome that particular problem of the togetherness, uh, I have come up with the idea, and we're working on that now, is to create a video where everyone is uploading now for me uh, their own singing of, a, of an arrangement that I wrote. And uh, I'm going to be putting together uh, the, the screen uh, where you see the nine ladies singing that song and you will hear them as well. So that's actually the only way we can be together. And we're very, very excited about this project. So the technology is both hindering us and now helping us to move forward and be an actual choir. So that's a beautiful thing. Uh, but uh, actually on a little different note, I, I didn't say anything positive, I think. And I wanted to fix that uh, in my previous uh, talk about this, and that is the value of collaborations. And that is something I wanted to mention, uh, which is that uh, of all the negatives that I mentioned of the of the energy and all those other things, there is one thing, which is that uh, now we are enabled to uh, collaborate with people around the world in a way that have never would have occurred to us before, you know, with uh, from everywhere. And uh, that has been really invaluable. And um, very inspiring to be able to record someone from London or New York or wherever in Europe or even Montreal here in Canada and uh, and have these people participate on, on my music making. So that really has been a beautiful thing. So I just wanted to add that so that there is something positive because I think I've gone a little too far with the all negative. Thank you. Thank you, Lenka. And I think as, uh, as audiences and as artists, to have that access worldwide is just spectacular. The one world family that is developing because we have the internet and applying it to the arts is, as David said, it's speeded up. It may have happened anyways, but it's speeded up in these conditions. Yes, you recall, please. Okay, I will tell you very, you know, very short, you know, I don't know whether I can com communicate what I think right now or not. I think that, you know, uh, as far as this visual art or, you know, pr plastic art is concerned, or, you know, creating something by hand, dealing with the material is concerned, it's, um, you know, <clears throat> it is, you know, physical experience and uh, it's not virtual. And art is not teaching, actually teaching technique is not actually art education, so to say. It's to teach art is very, you know, difficult. And, uh, you know, <laughs> every each of uh, the person has to internalize the experience by themselves. It's a very, you know, personal journey and personal work, actually. So in internet, actually, you know, it's, uh, you can teach the technique, you can guide by you know saying or by concept or whatever, but the all the works which they have to do is their own work actually. They can't kind of share the you know individual work. This this I small little thing. And the as far as the quality or the what art is is concerned, it will not, you know, online doesn't diminish this. to share the physical art object or whatever the quality will not be transferred to anyone. It's not communicating, it's you know, because it's just like an image. But uh, depth, as far as you know, depth and seriousness is concerned, it will not diminish. That's what I feel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuriko. I know we're running short on time at this point, but I do you want some, you have a short? Yeah, yeah, um, very short. Uh, uh, for the depth and the seriousness, uh, I think, I don't think so. I mean, whatever the condition would not affect it because the depth and seriousness come from within. So in my experience uh, during the pandemic last year, since last March, if I can say honest, I, I think many artists as well uh, have a same situation like me. This is a, a right time to create many projects because, you know, 
artists must be like, you know, suffering that they can get an inspiration. So if we can think positive, this is the right time to create, to collaborate, and to be united all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's such a wonderful way to end our panel and our time together. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience will learn a lot and kindle that interest in being online with the arts, both as performers and audience, I think is what I'm hearing also in what each of us are saying. And I wish everybody great success online with your arts in all your projects. May your audiences grow and may our One World family enjoy your art and may artists bloom. Thank you, everybody.